spring had never been Eloise's favorite season. It was just too undecided with the, the brown grass and the naked raspberry canes. She felt like a kid wanting to ask, are we there yet? But she couldn't see <laughs> who was driving. But every now and then there was a perfect day like this one. She and Artie were in their Muskoka chairs and he had his homemade root beer and she had a glass of tea from last year's herb garden. There was a dog or three curled up nearby and uh, they usually had a lap cat each. Artie called it sitting on the porch, even though they couldn't actually see the house from behind the hedge. There was just woods on one side and the garden on the other. Gardening had just started getting busy. The skinny little tomato plants were shoots still just starting in the shed in their pots and they didn't look like much yet, but she knew. She'd been gardening long enough not to worry about a wobbly slow start. This had been home now for nearly 30 years these 10 acres west of town. When they had bought it, the house was in good shape, but it was, it was boring. It was just a wood frame farmhouse. But since then, Artie had added a studio on the back with huge sunny windows and he'd been painting the house. You see, there's painting and there's painting. Artie would go to the hardware store for whatever, and he'd come home with a, a discount gallon can of some paint that somebody decided that they didn't want after all, pink or blue or yellow or black. And he'd started turning the house into some kind of abstract experiment. Sometimes she wondered if he might actually have a plan because he'd stand out in front and be staring up at something and frowning and then, you know, next thing he's up the ladder with a couple of buckets and some brushes and he'd be dabbing away at something that hadn't been quite right. She sipped her tea and looked over at him. It looked like he'd fallen asleep, his hand cradling the bottle of root beer. They hadn't had any kids. But over the years, they'd adopted so many cats and dogs and rabbits and ferrets that she lost count. From shelters, from neighbors, from the ditch near home. Skinny and sick or hurt and scared or just unwanted and abandoned. And slowly, slowly coming to realize that these two people were safe. And it wasn't just animals. Years ago, Artie had bought an old camper and he'd parked it in a cluster of trees out of sight of the road. He'd fixed it up just a bit and run some wires from the house for power and for heat. He'd built an outhouse and an outdoor shower and somehow let it be known that the trailer was there for anyone who needed it. And every few weeks, Eloise would look out the kitchen window and see that the lights were on in the trailer. Sometimes the people would come and go unseen, but some would come over to say hi. Some would chop wood or pull weeds. Some would leave a gift on the back porch to say thanks. There were a few regulars, but nobody ever left a mess and nobody ever did any damage. She wondered where they all came from and how they'd heard about Artie's little hotel, but... Uh, it was just so perfectly him. People couldn't believe it when she had married the hippie. <laughs> She'd always been a good girl. She obeyed her parents. She respected her teachers. She loved Jesus, but it was the 70s. And, you know, she started thinking that maybe Maybe there was more to loving Jesus than just being good. She was 18 the day of the protest. 
a poor neighborhood was being bulldozed for a new shopping mall and people had just been turned out with only a month's notice to find new homes and, and some refused to leave and some just couldn't. But the sheriff was going to go in with eviction notices and some people around town decided that they had to do something. So about 30 of them met in a church basement and make, made signs and learned about nonviolent protest and uh, they piled into cars and trucks and headed over. It was her very first sit-in, arm in arm with strangers. Thus saying, this should not be. And of course they'd been arrested. <laughs> She'd met Artie in the paddy wagon. She called her parents from the police station and they bailed her out. Eloise was absolutely confident that Jesus would not mind her getting arrested. Her parents were not so sure. But when the organizers were fined, her parents, you know, contributed to the collection. She and Artie had met up again a few times at meetings and protests in the soup kitchen. And then he started picking her up at home. Her parents weren't sure about the long hair and the John Lennon peepers and the tattoos, but he always came to the door and he always knocked and he was polite. And they said one time, surprisingly intelligent. But he had a hard time sitting still. So they didn't go to church very often. Eloise had been raised in church and it was important to her. So he tried. She knew how lucky she was to have been raised by good parents, to have gotten to know Jesus young, to have had a few really good friends. She had that rare gift to, to have always known that she was loved. A lot of people were not so blessed. Like Artie, his road to knowing that he was loved was rough. When they met, he was so cynical. He suspected everyone. People were only nice to you if they wanted something. But he got there in time. It sunk in somehow that Eloise loved him. And even better, so did Jesus and sharing that love, they got married. At sunrise on a beach, barefoot. And instead of rings, they got matching heart-shaped tattoos. Artie had said that rings were the base unit of chains and he was not having that. Besides, you could take a ring off anytime you wanted to. Tattoos were permanent. Eloise liked that, and after they had time to think about it, so did her parents. Their marriage had not been 35 years of daisies and peace. Neither of them were perfect. They had their flaws and their weaknesses and their fears, and they'd hurt each other, and they'd disappointed each other, and they'd disagreed, but together they had built something wonderful. They'd never had much money. Eloise worked breakfast and lunch at a diner. Artie worked at odd jobs, sometimes odd hours. Sometimes he got fired or he quit because the boss was stupid or because the job was boring, but he'd find something. He'd find something else. And he sold his art at the farmer's market. And every Saturday they volunteered together at the animal shelter. And every other Sunday they went to church. And little by little, they built their life. Little by little, they became better people because they were together and because they had Jesus to share. Little by little, they learned what he wanted from them and who he had made them to become. Artie said once, yeah, man, it's like, it's like gardening, right? 
It's like gardening. It's a lot of work to turn a field into a garden and to turn a garden into a good garden. You gotta take stuff out, you gotta put stuff in. And that's what Jesus does, man. He doesn't just leave you there, he makes you better. Huh. Eloise, she worried sometimes about the future. They weren't young anymore. They weren't old, but they were getting there. They had no family and no savings, and she didn't think the cats were going to look after them. And the idea of selling those 10 acres home made her tremble. Waking up somewhere else every day with no garden and no woods and no studio or with no arty. But it probably wasn't going to happen today. And there wasn't much that she could do about it. She looked at her snoozing husband again and smiled. Such a good life so far. Such a good life right now. And she was terribly, terribly thankful. Thankful for having been loved. Thankful for sun and tomato sprouts and raspberry canes and fiddleheads. Thankful for a lap full of cat and a snoring dog. For someone to fall asleep beside. For homemade root beer and herbal tea from last year's garden and a heart-shaped tattoo. Thankful for being made into a better garden.